This is Underdog Portfolio Weekly, hosted by Scott Connor. Welcome back onto the trading floor. And as you can see, this is not Dynasty Portfolio Weekly. That is on hiatus for the summer. This is a new show that will be launching every Wednesday night on the Destination Debbie YouTube channel. So tune in for underdog content here every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. And this is going to be the cadence. I have decided to max enter Best Ball Mania 5. I wanted to take on the challenge of the premier fantasy football contest in the industry. It's the first time that I've really gotten serious about doing this. So you are going to learn along the way, draft with me along the journey of Max entering Best Ball Mania 5 for this season. And this is going to be the cadence on the channel. So every week you're going to get content 8 p.m. Eastern Time here on the Destination Debbie YouTube channel. Like, subscribe. If you haven't signed up for Underdog, you will want to do that before next week. That will be our first live draft show. Use promo code ALLGAS, deposit $10.00. Get access to Underdog and all the tournaments and contests that they will be launching this summer. So this show is going to be Underdog Portfolio Weekly. I'm going to talk through kind of what my strategy is going to be, break down the tournament, break down why I'm going to be approaching things a certain way. And again, this is the first time that I'm doing this super seriously. I've dabbled in Underdog. I've played in Best Ball Mania for the last three years, played in some tournaments here or there, but never taken it super serious in terms of building a portfolio. And I want to do this because not only is it going up against the best in the industry, but it is a game theory challenge that I am always up for. That has been the basis of my content since I got into the content creation space back in 2018. So now that we're here, I want to take on this challenge and I want everybody to come along with me and do it. So every week you're going to get content. Half of the weeks are going to be Underdog Portfolio Weekly, where I'm going to talk about the portfolio management, update everybody on where I'm at in drafts, where I'm at with correlation and stacking and exposure on players and team builds and roster builds and all of that stuff. That's going to be every other week. And then in the alternative weeks, it will be a live Best Ball Mania 5 draft. We're probably going to get at least eight Best Ball Mania 5 drafts on the channel this summer. I'll probably do one with Ray. I'll probably do one with people from other sites. And I'll probably bring on some guests as well from Destination Devi. So it's going to be fun just to hang out every other week and draft a BBM5 draft. And then in the alternate weeks, you will get a Best Ball Mania Portfolio Weekly or an Underdog Portfolio Weekly show where I'm updating everybody on my progress. And it's going to be new for me. I've never taken on something this big. And I wanted to do it because I think it will help people that play Dynasty. It'll help people that play Dynasty best ball immensely. So don't tune out if you're a Dynasty player. There will be a lot of Dynasty discussion amongst the show, especially during the live streams. I'm going to try to work in some Dynasty commentary and whatnot during those streams because when you're live drafting, there's going to be a chat going on and there's going to be time in between picks to kind of do some analysis and talk through some strategy but also related to Dynasty. I think there's a ton in this industry, in the best ball game specifically, that we can learn and apply to Dynasty. Roster construction, war, correlation, stacking, all of those things have a place in Dynasty. The only difference is a lot of times Dynasty have this extra component known as the market. There's trading. There's future draft picks. There's other things that provide constraints, but also some freedom in terms of other assets that you can use. Whereas in something like Underdog, everything is contained, right? It's best ball. There's no waivers. There's no trading. And you know the parameters of who you're going to be playing week to week because there is no playing somebody else week to week. There's no randomization in terms of that. So it's a lot more defined and it has to be for a contest that this has this many people and it has this big of a prize pool. So we'll talk about that in a second. I'll give you my baseline plan at the end of this show. But what I wanted to come on this week and talk about was not only the plan, the schedule, I'm going to be max entering it. So I'm going to be jamming home 150 drafts in Best Ball Mania 5 between now and Labor Day. I've already started, already got about 10 deep thus far since it opened, but I'm going to be jamming in a lot more, including the ones that we do live here. And there's going to be other tournaments probably as well that I may get into. The Superflex tournament, if and when they launch that, I'm going to be getting into that. I don't know how much, but I want to get into that and also talk about that on the streams and on the shows, because I think we can learn a lot 
from the roster construction part. So I want to give a real basic background on how I got here and how my plan for going through this is going to come together. So we'll go back to the beginning of this year where I was talking to Ray about, you know, what's the plan this year for underdog? What do I want to do personally from an underdog standpoint? And so what he and I did is we actually went and dabbled into the FFPC Never Too Early Best Ball Tournament. Now, it's a little bit different. Anyone that's played on FFPC before, uh, it is a smaller pool, but ultimately it is still the same type of theory in terms of it being a best ball contest. There's no waivers. There's no trading. It's single elimination in the playoffs to where basically the point totals advance you to the next round. And that it is a regular season where it is just most points. And then once that's over, you advance each round until you get to the end. And the winner at the end brings home the prizes. So we did that. We got into the never too early best ball tournament in FFPC. It opened as soon as the 2023 season ended. And it went right up until the NFL draft. Now, this is a $125 entry fee or $125 entry fee per team. So unlike underdog, you can only enter 43 contests or 43 teams in this tournament because there's a lot less teams that make up the total tournament. There's only 1,440, whereas underdog, there's over 672,000 people that will be in BBM5. So consider this to be a higher stakes version, but a much smaller tournament, right? We had 40 entries out of 1,440. So think of that relative to the number of teams you could enter in Best Ball Mania 5 compared to how many teams are out there. So we have a much larger stake in terms of the total teams versus how many are in the total tournament itself. So it's 1,440, and we did 40 drafts. Now, the only real differences here is FFPC is 1.5 tight end premium. So the tight end scoring is obviously different from underdog, which is half PPR. There's no kickers, no defenses, just like underdog. But there are 20 man rosters. So instead of 18, like there is an underdog, there are 20 man rosters in FFPC. And really, not a lot else changes other than it is PPR instead of half PPR. But that's it. It's 1.5 tight end premium, it's PPR for everybody else, and it's two extra roster spots. And Ray and I just said, you know what? We're going to go draft. We drafted some of these together, we drafted some of them by ourselves, and then we compared. So what I'm going to do is kind of go through our total portfolio and keep in mind, this was done before the NFL draft. So that was also interesting. Now, people may say, well, why would you want to put that much money up and draft that many teams pre-NFL draft? It's a closed contest, meaning all the information that we had was the same as everybody else we were drafting with. There was no, some people got to draft their teams in the same tournament after the NFL draft. And that's one of the first things you have to consider if you're drafting or entering one of these tournaments is what is the time span? This opened right when the season ended and it closed as soon as we got to draft week. So draft week, they cut it off. They were on pace to finish. They closed out all the drafts. No more. As soon as the last one went off, that was it. But we were all operating under the same information from the beginning of the season, so it was middle of January or so, until the week of the NFL draft. That three months, an extra week or so, we were all drafting in the same tournament with the same information. And Ray and I figured, you know what? We have a little bit of an edge when it comes to rookies. We're pretty up on draft capital and making some bets pre-draft that maybe other people weren't as comfortable with doing. Now, of course, anybody that's in these tournaments in January or February, they're probably pretty adept at consuming the same information. But we were able to get a little bit of an edge, we thought, not just from the players, but also from roster constructing using our war tool. Shout out to Destination Devi, destinationdevi.com. You can check out the war tool there. But you run something like the war tool, and then you take our knowledge together. A lot of times we had some different opinions, but what we always seem to agree on is Let's build this way. Let's correlate this way. So that's what I'm going to walk through today and how that has kind of led me to forming my plan for underdog this year. So we did 40 teams. And again, these are 20 rounds. And the first thing you really have to narrow down when you're looking to enter a tournament, even if you're not max entering the tournament, you have to have some basic parameters as to how you want to roster construct. Not where you take players, not what players you take, 
but what type of builds are you going to have for your team? And largely, we did that. So in FFPC specifically, there's 20 rounds in the draft. So you're going to roster 20 players. And we tried to stay within the same types of builds. And it was interesting because I went and looked, and we ended up having seven different builds. And when I say seven different builds, it means three quarterbacks, six running backs, eight receivers, three tight ends. That was the most common, most popular build that we had. That was 19 of the 40 teams stayed within that framework. So if you pick a framework like that, and I'll talk about it here in a little bit on how to pick that for underdog, pick a framework like that, and that is what you are loosely working under when you're drafting your teams. We had a couple others where we strayed, and it was because you know we thought we maybe took a player earlier than maybe we wanted to, and then we ended up doubling down on that. So we had a lot invested in one position, and then maybe we would take one less of that position. But thinking that way, that is the most important thing, is not only understanding how many roster spots, what are the types and combinations of builds that you want, but then also just having a feel while you're drafting, especially if you're doing 5, 10, 15 drafts at one time, being able to manage that on the fly. And we'll talk about a tool that I'm going to be using that's going to help me manage that all throughout with my roster construction. But it's important to hammer that home. Hey, 3683, that's what we would call it if we had three quarterbacks, six running backs, eight receivers, and three tight ends. The next one, 3593. So one less running back, five. One more wide receiver, nine. We did that 12 out of 40 times. So between those two builds, 31 of our 40 teams fit that roster construction. 3683, 3593. So those were always in the back of my mind going, okay, I'm always kind of counting when I make a pick. All right, that was our second quarterback. We're going to take one more, but based on what's on the board, when should we strategically think about taking that? And if we want to stack, if we want to correlate, we didn't know the schedule yet either. We still don't know the schedule as of the release of this video, but still we wanted to kind of keep an eye on when we take those players, but more importantly, how we're building the team. We went rogue on a couple others. Our next most common build was a 2693. So very similar to the 3593, we just took one more running back and one less quarterback. And if you think about that, this kind of goes to I know we're not talking super flex here, but it kind of goes to thinking about the strength of the position. Meaning why would you take two quarterbacks instead of three? You know, given how best ball scoring's distributed, Two quarterbacks is leaving you pretty slim for the entire season. You're going to have at least a week or two, based on the bye weeks, depending on when they fall, where you only have one quarterback available. And if one of them is injured during one of those weeks, you're taking a zero. So it's risky, but one of the biggest things you have to remember when you're doing a tournament like this, not a single team, and this is where it differs from Dynasty and where if you're a Dynasty player listening to this, you have to contextualize this information, is you can't fix it. In Dynasty, you can fix stuff. You have three quarterbacks that are starters and they all go down. Okay, I can fix that. The guys that went down, they may have some trade value. I can trade one of them. In best ball, you can't do that. But you also want to draft like you're going to be right. Because here's the thing. Nobody else can fix it either. And a lot of times people don't think about that. You get in a draft and you can watch somebody's build and you go, they're hedging. They're not drafting like they're right. They're drafting like, well, what if something bad happens? Let me handcuff a running back. Or what if this quarterback that I drafted really early, Anthony Richardson or Joe Burrow, what if they get injured? I need a third quarterback. Well, but if you're drafting Anthony Richardson at QB5, you should be betting he's not going to get injured. And the more teams you're doing, the more you should be willing to double down on the fact that, hey, he's not going to get injured. Because if every time you say, well, if I draft him, I need to take a third QB because he's injury prone, you're actually getting into your own potential profits there. You're hurting yourself because you're hedging and you're lowering your upside on your team. And that concept, I think, is sometimes lost because people get scared when they're drafting. Well, what if something bad happens? This team is going to be destroyed. But the reality is that bad thing is probably happening. Let's say you do 20 leagues. That same bad thing that could happen to you is happening in the other 19 leagues where you don't have that build. So if you think about it that way, as long as you're optimally constructing and picking your build, draft like you are going to be correct. You don't draft to be wrong. 
Don't necessarily draft and say, well, if this guy gets injured, then this guy will replace him. Or this outcome could happen, but if it doesn't, this other player on the same team could have that type of outcome. Now, at very late places in drafts, that's okay. But you probably don't want to be thinking about that logic in the earlier middle parts of your draft. So that's the most important. Now, back to our FFPC teams. So once we kind of narrow down, those are going to be the three most popular builds, the 3683, the 3593, and the 2693. What do one thing all those have in common? Three tight ends. Now, this is tight end premium. So in FFPC, we made it almost a habit of taking three tight ends no matter what. And the reason for that is there's just more likelihood in that format that they're going to hit your flex randomly. But at the same time, the prices of the elite tight ends get nuked way up in FFPC because people think, well, tight end premium, that matters a ton. I have to draft them higher. When the reality is, if you follow war, if you followed me talk about roster construction and my roster construction series on Destination Dynasty, when you have 1.5 tight end premium, it really doesn't matter outside of the top 10, 12 tight ends. So if you wanted to justify moving them up a little bit, sure. But outside of those, those are not even optimal flexes for a 1.5 tight end premium. So you don't necessarily want to say, well, I'm going to draft tight end 20 higher here because it's 1.5 tight end premium. So because we basically were out on a lot of the early tight ends because they would move up so high, and we did a couple where we only did two tight end builds, but largely we were saying, you know what, after a certain range, call it tight end 12, the tight ends don't matter that much. We're just trying to draft three with opportunity. And I'm not going to talk specific players so much here, but some of those worked out great. Some of them worked out awful. And that's just what happens when you do this pre-draft, you do this pre-free agency. There were some tight ends we were in on prior to free agency. And oops, they ended up getting either replaced or they signed another tight end. That happened as well. But back to the build. So once we kind of got our strategy on, these are going to be the builds. 36 of our 40 teams followed these builds. The other four kind of went rogue. We had a team that had 10 receivers. We had a team that had seven running backs. We had a team that went four tight ends. And, and that might have been a honest mistake from one of us taking a fourth tight end. I don't think that was intentional. Probably should have not counted, but it happens when you're doing this many teams and when you're co-managing with somebody else. Uh, and that was really the outliers, but there weren't a lot of outliers. So that is the main takeaway that I wanted to really iron down before I started Best Ball Mania 5 is what are going to be the primary roster builds. And I'll get to that here in just a second. I know you're itching to hear about what it is for underdog because that's what this is going to be about for this summer. So then we look at some of the portfolio here. And again, 40 teams. So I wanted to just figure out, okay, where am I comfortable or uncomfortable with my exposure? And unfortunately, unlike underdog and the tool that I'll pump here in just a second that I'm going to be using to kind of track all of this, we don't have a great way to really track the correlation and the stacking so much in FFPC. So I wish I had that, but now that I have the tool that I'm going to talk about here in a minute, uh, it's really going to be helpful to be able to track it in real time so I can stay a little bit closer uh, to being able to find out where players correlate with bye weeks, with matchups head to head, and then definitely with the, the stacking between quarterbacks, tight ends, receivers, and players on the same team. So we ended up with a couple things that stood out to me. The highest exposure for the most part came at the wide receiver position and at the quarterback position, meaning we tended to draft the same guys over and over at those positions. And I'm trying to sit here and look at this and say, man, why did we end up with some of the same quarterbacks at over 15% of our teams? How did we end up with a lot of the same receivers Heck, we had 19 different receivers that we had 15% or more ownership on. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but then you think about how many receivers are out there, and this included the rookies, if you remember. We only drafted 92 different receivers. In a typical year, there's usually over 120 receivers that will crack lineups. And shallow lineups like this, it's probably not that much less. But our exposure didn't really look like that. So I'm trying to sit here and look at this and go, 
Am, are we overweight? And maybe that was a little much me when it comes to my wide receiver theory, my wide receiver threshold theory. I maybe stuck to that a little too much when it came to FFPC. And can we learn from that for underdog? I don't know. That's one of the main questions that I'm going to really have to wrestle with in terms of what I want my final portfolio exposure to look like, because we are in a FFPC or a wide receiver crazy world right now. Meaning that the primary for a lot of people is hammer receiver. I can get running backs later, especially running backs that I know are going to get touches. And then depending on where I take my quarterbacks, I'm going to determine when I'm going to maybe take some of my later receivers, but it's very common for it just to be hammer receiver, hammer receiver, hammer four or five straight receivers, get the running backs in the mid rounds where I know they have roles and then back end stack my quarterbacks with the receivers that I already drafted. Cause I don't know exactly what receivers I'm going to take. Maybe I do in round one or round two, depending on where I'm picking. But then when you get round three, four, five, six, you're going to get sniped. You're going to have some players come off the board in different orders. And everybody's trying to jockey for where they're going to end up. It's like a game of musical chairs. If anyone's played that, you go around in a circle. There's eight people going around in a circle and there's seven chairs. Everybody's kind of eyeing like where they want to end up. And that's what it feels like when you're drafting these early receivers. People are just pounding receivers, and then they're going, well, now that I have these four receivers, here are the quarterbacks, here are the other players that are going in certain ranges, whether that be tight ends or other receivers, where I can create these stacks. And that's generally how people are playing this. So could I learn anything from this? I don't know if I can sit here and say it was wrong to get 15% or more of 19 different receivers. What I can say is that there were a lot of times that I ended up drafting just one more receiver in a build than I probably needed to because there was this FOMO. There was this fear of missing out on receivers that I thought I could project for this mythical threshold or this mythical floor. And so that's one thing I'm probably going to back off a little bit in underdog. A, because it's half PPR, but B, because I'm putting in more teams, which means I'm going to want to have a little more diversity in terms of some of the different player combinations that I have. So I don't want to pin myself into having 25% of this one receiver, especially if it's one that's going fairly early, because I'm probably going to be very limited in how those teams are going to be built. Now, there's going to be times where you pick a receiver or two early, and the teams you're going to build around that receiver, quarterback-wise, other weapon-wise, are going to be similar. But I, I think the biggest takeaway at the receiver position is to just be a little less sure of where those target thresholds are going to be. There would be times where I would go, and it usually happened right around wide receiver 40, 45-ish, where you just see the names on the board, and a dynasty mind like myself is sitting there just saying, man, I, I can't draft Mike Williams. I just can't draft Curtis Samuel, Cortland Sutton. There's a bias that exists there. And then... Three rounds later, there's tons of receivers where I go, yeah, I'll take a shot on that player. That's round 12, though. That's not round nine. No way I can take Mike Williams in round nine. Just giving an example of a player that might have been there. So there's just a, a bias there. And I think it's perpetuated by the fact that a lot of the leagues were just draft receiver heavy. And then the mid rounds, you're taking a quarterback, probably two or three running backs. So generally, that was a range that was just a dead spot. Didn't get of a lot of exposure in that wide receiver 40 to 55 range because generally we just weren't picking there. So that was the one takeaway that I need to be a little more cognizant on when drafting underdog. With the quarterbacks, I'll tell you what, because I don't have the spike week tool, that's the tool I've been talking about. I'm going to use the spike week tool to really help correlate and construct stacking. And I didn't have that in FFPC. So it was a little more haphazard. So I tend to think that the quarterback roster ship in underdog is going to balance itself out a little bit more than here. Probably not going to have 22% Bryce Young in Best Ball Mania 5, only because there's just not a lot of options that you can build with a guy like Bryce Young. There's some. I'm going to have some teams, but it's not going to be that high. Whereas in FFPC, it was more of like, let's just take the best value. So not having that tool, I think, exposes your biases a little bit at something like quarterback. So that's what I learned. Not too much takeaway from tight ends. I would say the one main thing with tight ends was 
Uh, we tend to fade the elite tight ends, even in the 1.5 premium, because they went higher. And generally, we're just willing to make bets against guys like Dalton Kincaid, against guys like Sam Laporta, Trey McBride, Bach Bowers. We got a little exposure to those guys, but 5% or less are on almost all of the elite tight ends. I think the only tight end that we had a ton of exposure to was Mark Andrews that was almost 10%. But other than that, a lot of the other ones that you would say, yeah, that's a top 10 tight end, David Njoku, Evan Ingram, Travis Kelsey, we didn't get a lot of exposure. And I'm going to want to correct that in Best Ball Mania 5, only because of the stacking element. There's going to be times where I'm going to go, man, it's gross to draft Evan Ingram here or David Njoku here, but there's going to be teams that I'm going to want to build around those stacks. So having the spike week tool, I think is really going to help with that. And then running backs, not much to take away with running backs. I treat running backs very similarly can I project a workload? And is there correlation at running back? Meaning if I'm going to draft Blake Corum, I'm making the bet that Blake Corum is going to be a significant impact player. Meaning I'm probably not drafting Kyron Williams on a similarly built team. Like you think about those contradictory outcomes at running back, because after you get past the certain 15 or so running backs, the opportunity share is going to be extremely flat. And then it's going to drop off a cliff. Because once the cliff hits, there's running backs that just don't have weekly roles. So navigating that middle range and where to take those relative to your quarterbacks and tight ends will be huge. So let's talk a little bit about underdog before we wrap this up. So talking about underdog specifically, the differences obviously being the scoring. Uh, So in underdog best ball mania five, it's half point per reception. So it's half PPR. Um, Everything else is pretty standard. All the other scoring, you know, two points for a two point conversion. It's four points per passing touchdown. All the receiving yardage and such is the same. It's two less roster spots. So that's the difference between FFPC is you have to probably be a little tighter with the use of your roster spots. You don't have those two extra. And you would think, well, 18 and 20, that's not that big of a difference. It really is. It really is. And when you're in a draft where there's 20 rounds and then you start drafting with 18 rounds, That extra shot at the end where you go, okay, I can back end stack my wide receiver nine. It's not available here. You have to make a choice on do you want to go with an extra running back or do you want to go with that extra receiver? So looking at optimal roster construction for Best Ball Mania 5, I'm probably operating under these types of builds. So we're talking two quarterback builds, two quarterback builds with the two extra roster spots gone a little more viable, I think, in underdog than it would be in FFPC. FFPC, you have an extra round. Everybody can take three quarterbacks, and they run out. Almost all the quarterbacks that could start plus more get drafted in those FFPC leagues. Underdog, it's not the case. You end up with 29 to 30 quarterbacks drafted, maybe a couple more if somebody really wants to create a stack with a backup like a Justin Fields or a Sam Howe, Michael Penix, something like that. But it's slimmer at quarterback, meaning you can get away with two quarterback builds. So two quarterback builds, either with seven receivers or eight receivers, you could go an extra tight end, but I wouldn't even recommend that. I don't even think I'm going to go with many four tight end builds, if any at all. It's something that a couple years ago was viable, but probably not going to be in the cards this year. So you already know one of the primary rules in underdog is you're drafting two or three quarterbacks and two or three tight ends. So right there, you know, four to six of your roster spots are going to be quarterback or tight end. So you can almost sync those, you know, one end and the other are the exact same. And you're just looking at how do I jockey those? Can I stack them? One of my favorite things to do is have at least two quarterbacks and two tight ends stacked, especially when they're late. If you're going to take a light tight end, and I've always inherently done this in Dynasty as well. But if you're going to stream tight end because the tight end premium is 1.5 or less in your dynasty league, but you're starting, insert Joe Burrow as one of my quarterbacks, it makes sense that if you're already streaming tight end, meaning you're punting, you don't have a top eight tight end, you don't have a top 10 tight end, you literally are better off just stacking Joe Burrow with his tight end, whoever that might be doesn't even matter. You're better off having that tight end specifically than any one of the other 10 that are in the same range because the production in the war flattens off. So that's going to be something that's going to be very common when you watch me draft is going to be if I end up drafting Anthony Richardson, I'm probably going to take shots only on those teams 
on the Colts tight end. Whoever it is that I think, and there's probably multiples at this point, but it would be more important to get that as my third tight end than a random guy that I think has a slightly better ADP value. So when you think about something like that, you're going to get your diversity just within the quarterback and tight end stacking right there. So I'm not as worried about my tight end diversity because if I'm following that principle, knowing that I'm only going to take two or three in every draft, I'm going to get a very diverse portfolio of tight ends, probably between two and 6%. We're talking like low end ones where I don't necessarily plan on having to use a specific round pick. Guys I can get in the last three or four rounds. And if you've done an underdog draft, there's only maybe 15 to 20 tight ends that are gone before round 14. So at the end, you're able to pick off the ones that you want. And if you're in a room with other people playing like this, a lot of times it's, they play nice. You'll get your tight end that you've already stacked with your quarterback because they're looking to, to do the same thing, right? If you're looking to get Geno Smith and Noah Fant, the only person you're really fighting for with Geno Smith would be the person that has DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett or Jackson Smith and Jigba. And if they take Geno Smith, then okay, maybe you don't take Noah Fant. But you're only really fighting one team for Geno Smith. It isn't like, oh, Geno Smith is such great value on the board, I'm going to take him. But I don't really need him. So if you get in a room with a lot of sharp people, it actually is easier to navigate the mid and late rounds of the draft once everybody's kind of picked their lane. So two quarterback builds, that's usually going to have five running backs and eight receivers with the three tight ends, or it's going to have six running backs and seven receivers. You can also go super slim at running back, meaning if you go three running backs in the first four rounds, and it's very tough to do with the today's ADP, just given where running backs are valued, it's very tough to do that and still feel good about the other positions. But if you did... You would basically go three high-end running backs, let's say three top 20 running backs, and then you only draft one more. You don't go, oh man, one of my three is Tony Pollard, and he's been injured before. I'm not sure. I need to draft two more just in case. No, you drafted the running backs that you took in a certain range, and it's probably not Tony Pollard. He goes a little bit later than that. But let's just say you go Devon A-Chain as your RB2, and then you take another one in round four. You've made your bet. Your bets have been placed. You're not going to go, well, what if A-Chain gets injured? I don't really feel good about that A-Chain build as my RB2. Let me take five now when you've invested three of your first four picks on underdog or on running back position. So if you do do that, it's a push and pull. So if you think about it like a sandwich, you have your quarterbacks, which is two to three, your tight ends, which is two to three, and then there's a teeter-totter in the middle. So think of it, I know this is a weird analogy, but think of it as like a fence on one side and a fence on the other. That is what is around the team. That's your quarterbacks and that's your tight ends. And then you have this teeter-totter in the middle of running backs and wide receivers where you're trying to balance, okay, how much equity did I put into the running back? If it was really early, maybe I'm going to put more equity later into the receiver and vice versa. If I hammer receiver early, Maybe I stop when I get to seven. Maybe I stop eight would be the max. If I hammered receiver early, I go five straight receivers. I'm only taking eight receivers max. I'm drafting like I'm right. I've drafted five of my first six picks being wide receivers. So I'm going to maybe take an extra running back if I only go seven receivers there. I'm going to take six. Now I'm going to have to take some more dart throws and take some more risk, but there's a reason that I'm taking six is because the first ones that I have are a little bit weaker. So just depending on where your fences are, it's a teeter-totter in the middle between the running backs and the wide receivers. And then just understanding that underdog is a total points game. So once we get the schedules, this isn't a head-to-head, week-to-week thing. This is a try to score the most, most points each week, and then after 14 weeks, the highest point totals for the season. And again, it's contained week-to-week, but the highest point totals through 14 weeks advance to the tournament. And then it's a three-week tournament, quarterfinals, semifinals, finals. And the payouts are pretty flat compared to what they were in years past. Again, I didn't, I only dabbled in years past, but there's pretty significant money. I mean, if you finish inside the top 20, you are winning six figures. And that was different. My understanding is that's way different than it was in years past. So maybe it is something that has turned some people off from not as much money in the regular season. 
But seeing the payouts being flatter, I like the chances of at least getting a couple teams. I mean, how many teams do I expect to get to the playoffs? So qualifying through 14 weeks to the playoffs? I have no clue. I haven't really even thought about it. And he can correct me, but I believe Ray last year had 36 potentially. And I'm not sure of that number, so don't hold me on it. But that seems like it's a reasonable number. And then whatever happens, happens. So that's kind of the strategy that I've given for this format. It's a little different in FFPC, but I think I can leave everybody with that analogy is to think about that construction. Even if you're only going to enter 10 teams, say you don't have the funds to enter 150 or say you want to get into one of the smaller tournaments, but you want to do a hundred. That's fine. But go through these principles and just make sure that you have a way to track it. And I'll give a shout out. This is the tool that I'm going to be using. Uh, It is going to be the Spike Week Draft Hacker tool, spikeweek.com. You can sign up for it. And it's really awesome. It works with your browser to essentially give you a lot of this data in real time. So when you're in the underdog draft room, and you'll see it on the screen uh, when I'm doing the live drafts on this channel, you'll see it. You'll see these different percentages, and it'll just highlight different things that you should be thinking about where you're stacking, where you're stacking with quarterbacks, where you're stacking with some of your early round picks, correlation. Once we get the schedule, it'll highlight correlation of teams that are playing each other during the playoffs. So seeing those things will kind of help you guide along the journey of building a portfolio. Because one thing that I struggle with and I struggled with in FFPC was keeping up with the portfolio. And this tool also runs your teams and gives you that data in real time while you're drafting. It's not, well, I looked at it yesterday and here's where I stood. Let me go do three more drafts today and then come back to it. Like in real time, you get the data and it syncs. So you're right there actually following along while you're drafting, kind of seeing that path laid out. And it's not really a cheat sheet. It's just a way to track what you're already trying to track. It's impossible to manually do this. So it's well worth the money to invest in this tool. You can sign up for it again, spikeweek.com. I plan on using it and I've never used it before. So all of this, and this is what I'm going to leave everybody with, all of this is going to be new. If you've made it this far in the video, how can I learn from this? You may be a dynasty player that is just going to dabble in underdog just to get your draft fix over the summer. But I'm going to try to hit on a lot of small things that I'm learning throughout that's going to help me think about dynasty a little bit different. Because I'll leave this as a hypothesis. This information, things like the Spike Week tool, all the data that's out there on Underdog. I mean, just just search Best Ball Mania Strategy. There are dozens of articles that you can read. Not necessarily about Best Ball Mania 3, 4. Some of them are a couple years old. But some of the game theory that's within those articles that you can go, okay, I'm not going to max enter Best Ball Mania. I don't even play Underdog much. But I play Dynasty. I have some Best Ball Dynasty. Be thinking that way. It's the line of thinking that I want to go through this exercise. Whether I win or lose, of course I want to win. But whether I win or lose, it's keeping this point of the brain sharp. Because that is the next iteration of edge. It is not, I know more data than you. I can scout players better than you. Heck, Destination Devi is all about tools, right? But at some point, all the tools that are out there, people are going to either buy all the Destination Devi tools and use those and become masters at those tools. And when there's more masters of a tool, it's less of an advantage. Or there's just going to be other tools out there that are similar. We're not the only ones that have a war machine. We're not the only ones that have a wide receiver model that are trying to figure out how to kind of hack the wide receiver position. And there's more tools coming from Destination Devi, but there's tools being built on tons of different sites out there. So to think we're just going to build a magical tool that is going to tell everybody the answers to the test is wrong. So while they're good resources, it's going to be very quick in this space where people catch up to them, more people use them, they master them, they take what they want to take, and then they go, you know what? The next edge to beat the other six league mates in my league that are also using all of these tools is to take them and go, what is the the psychological edge? What is the roster construction edge? What is the next edge? And I don't even know what it is half the time. That's pretty much why I'm doing this series, why I'm going to be doing Best Ball Mania all summer. Shout out again to Underdog Fantasy for the platform for Destination Devi, destinationdevi.com. Again, sign up for Underdog at underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code ALLGAS, do a deposit, 
You can draft against me here on Underdog Portfolio Weekly, which will run every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So tune in next week, our first live draft. Hopefully I'll have all the kinks worked out by then, but I'm just going to go live. And if you want in the draft, what I'm probably going to do is go live, probably hit enter the live draft. It's a 30 second timer. And I'm going to do that a couple minutes before I start the show. So if you want in, and we'll try it for the first one. I'll probably put this out to our community over on Discord, destinationdevy.com or patreon.com backslash all gas and see who wants to get in with me. And it'll be in the one that I'll be doing live on the feed. But after that, we'll see how it works. And I'll continue to do it every other Wednesday night, a live Best Ball Mania 5 draft, 8 p.m. Eastern here on the channel. So if you want in, be around at that time. Come hang out in the chat. Try to get in and draft against me. And if you're in the chat and you're drafting against with me, I will interact. No reason not to. Everybody can see it, so there's not going to be a mystery as to what my plan is going to be. I'll be talking through it on the stream. That is one of the downsides of drafting live, is other people literally can be in there listening to you. So I'm on for the challenge. Hopefully everybody follows along with me. And until next week, where we'll be drafting live in Best Ball Media 5, be chill.